for June 21st, 2023. Uh, Holly, would you take the roll, please? President Smalley? Here. Vice President Hill? Here. Director Ackerman? Here. Director Pulse? Here. Director Mayhood? Here. Okay. Uh, Rick, any additions or deletions to the uh, Yes, Chair Smalley, uh, before we start the meeting, I would ask that we take a moment of silence in honor of Joshua, district engineer who passed away on June 8th. Uh, he will be greatly missed both professionally and personally. Thank you, Rick. I'd like to uh, proceed with the meeting now. Um, <clears throat> oral communications. Um, this part of the meeting is for anybody from the uh, public who has uh, an item that's not on the agenda this evening that they would want to bring up that's within the jurisdiction of the uh, water district. Does anybody from the public wish to do so? If not, I see none. Uh, we will move on then to new business. First item is the um, Foreman pressure break structure project. Rick? Yes, um, I will uh, present this to the board uh, or uh, staff is asking the board um, to approve authorize an expenditure of $119,400 for design of the form and pressure break structure. Uh, the district's north system surface water supply is comprised of water diverted from Foreman clear, Peabine, sweet water, clear, and cool. Uh, this raw water is collected near the Foreman Creek intake structure and conveyed to the Lion Water Treatment Plant um, prior to release to the district uh, distribution system. The collection of the raw water from diversions ranging in elevation from 1,300 feet uh, down to 928 feet requires that a pressure break uh, be provided prior to conveyance uh, into the water treatment plant. Uh, this reduction in pressure is accomplished uh, in a pressure break structure, uh, which brings the collected water to a uniform atmosphere pressure. Um, during the CZU fire, the uh, uh, Previous uh, pressure break structure was destroyed by fire. Um, this is um, a proposal to uh, redesign the structure for construction. Uh, we did receive two bids, uh, one from f &L for $119,400, and the whole thing just disappeared. And I remember the whole one just disappeared. There we go. And we have the second bid was for San, from Sandus uh, for $382,299. Uh, or uh, $999. Staff is recommending that uh, we award to FNL in the amount of $119,400. Okay. <laughs> um, questions from the board, uh, Bob? Any idea, Rick, why uh, the Big difference. I'm sorry, Bob. I'm any any idea why the big difference in bids, even after the normalization? No, um, you know, obviously we we've, we've dealt with both of those firms uh, in the past. I'm not sure if if Josh had conversation with uh, uh, with the firms to find out. Um, I have not, but yes, it is a big difference. Um, there is some engineering calculations to, for velocities through the box uh, uh, to remove the entrained air. But basically, it's just a, a huge concrete vault with, with chambers and, and screens in it. Um, but I couldn't tell you why there's a, a big discrepancy. 
And what kind of structure was there before? Large concrete um, basin, like a large septic tank with a uh, wood uh, roof where staff could walk in and access catwalks and screens and chambers. But it actually cracked from the high heat. Um, oh, and, yeah, and uh, had several uh, stress cracks in the concrete chamber. So, the, and uh, the building that was off to the side of it uh, was a wood frame structure. It burnt as well. And there was considerable battery bank uh, that created a hazmat. And so everything was removed. And um, the new structure will be fire resistant. As much as possible, it was heat. You know, that will definitely be part of the design criteria. Yeah. Um, to talk about that and obviously the wood roof would probably not be wood yeah. roof it'll be you know a metal roof structure and the building will be uh, most likely concrete with a metal roof structure okay uh, jeff no comments i seems straightforward okay. to me jamie um, I, uh, this seems very straightforward. Obviously we need this. Um, so I'm prepared to, uh, vote to support this, but, um, Mark, I, you know, I, I just want to take a minute to, um, say publicly how sorry I am, um, to the staff, um, and to, uh, Josh's widow, Araya for, um, for his loss. And so I, I don't know that there's a more appropriate time for me to do that, but, so just know that, you know, he's been in all of our hearts. And with that, I will send it back to you. Okay. Um, Gail? Um, I agree with Jeff that this is uh, largely straightforward, and I want to echo um, Jamie's comments. I think um, we've we've all had Joth and, and the staff um, in our thoughts. And I think um, I've just, uh, it must have been really difficult to carry on. And I'm just very impressed at how you guys powered through and produced the agenda that we see tonight. And that despite all the things um, that have been going on, you managed to continue keeping the district going. And I, I really appreciate the fact that you've done that. Thank you, Gil. Um, a couple of questions that I have on this pressure break structure. Uh, when when was the original one installed? About 20 years ago, 30 years ago? Maybe probably 25, 30 years ago. Okay. Um, I see that, that in the uh, memo here, uh, no environmental um, no environmental review or no environmental requirements. Um, is that just for this investigation portion? Just that's just for the design for the actual for the construction will require environmental. Okay, that makes that makes sense then. Um, do we need this now? Being if we're are we feeding foreman um, water in there solely right now? That is correct. Okay. If we're feeding from one, you know, one source, do we need the pressure break, or is, does the pressure break come into play if and when we have P vine? Uh, yes, we, the pressure break will come into play when we have one additional source to form it. So right. that most likely will be P vine. Right, um, it's the quickest one to install. One of the problems we'll run into without contacting FEMA is there are time restraints when we need to move ahead. Mm -hmm. And there will be considerable environmental on this project and may take some time to get through. Uh, it'll definitely take field visits with Cal Fish and Wildlife right. and probably other regulatory uh, agencies because okay. it's right in or outside of the riparian corridor. Right, okay, so moving ahead with the design. Right. Uh, construction. Uh, Ideally, would sync up with whenever a next with P line water line is installed. That's correct. Okay, that makes sense. Then. Okay. Um, and to a question that Bob asked earlier about uh, the cost differential, we've seen similar cost differentials with these two firms. 
of some previous bids. No, I know, but I was, I was just was curious if we had some. And as to, I, I looked at the number of hours that Candace had in versus what. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't, you know, a significant difference in the number of hours they had at the time that it was taken. So I don't think that's fine. This, this may have something to do with how busy they are, yeah. Yeah. how much they want Could the be. business. Yeah. Yep. That's yeah. what my thoughts are. Could be busy they are. Yeah. I actually talked to Josh about it. Yeah. And he said, uh, I said, well, what, what happened to your old firm, Sandus? And he said, I guess they didn't want the job. Okay. So. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, as a follow up to that, though, I did have a question about uh, in terms of. FEMA's timelines um, in terms of restoring the actual structure, they're obviously going to contribute to that as well. Um, are we okay on that? If that doesn't, yeah, we have been requesting uh, extension timeline extensions and been working with FEMA because those projects haven't even been obligated yet. So they're still reviewing um, our proposals and our damage. And that is our reasons for continuing to ask for um, extensions because the work was supposed to be completed 18 months after the actual event, but obviously the okay. no way that's happening. So they've been granting the uh, uh, extensions, but I would get nervous if their process was done and then we were asking because you they want detailed reasons why you want an extension. And obviously environmental review and those type of um, uh, issues with the project, they have no problem with. But if we just because we want to wait, we may have some issues. Okay. Um, and I think the timeline will fall in with the feedline supply line uh, once we get design done and then start the environmental. I don't doubt the environmental will take some time. Yeah, I mean, the, the agencies aren't going to operate on FEMA schedule or anything like that, right? So. Okay. Um, before I go off to the public, then I'd like to make a motion um, that the board direct the district manager to enter into a contract with Ferrer Loretta in an amount not to exceed one hundred nineteen thousand four hundred for the purposes of design work related to the Foreman pressure break. I will second that. Okay. Um, any uh, comments or questions from the public? about this item. Um, seeing none, um, Holly, would you take a roll call vote, please? President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Foles? Yes. Director Mayhood? Yes. Okay. Uh, moving on then to the uh, the next item, uh, the Bracken Brain Forest Springs Initial Study and Mitigated Mitigated Negative Declaration. Yes, and I'll ask the uh, environmental planner, uh, Carly Plancher, to introduce um, this uh, item and uh, our consultants. Great. Thank you, Rick. Uh, we do have Garrett Peterson uh, with us today to answer questions. I'll go ahead and introduce the item, and then at the end, uh, we'll go ahead and jump into the questions. So the district is looking to consolidate two small mutual water companies, Forest Springs and Brackenbrae, to provide water supply to approximately 440 customers. In 2022, the California Department of Water Resources awarded the district with a small community drought relief program grant of $3.2 million. The grant included funds to upgrade and install approximately 9,000 linear feet of water main and to install a new pump house station. However, the grant did not supply funding for all the project infrastructure needs. So in addition to the installation of the approximately 9,000 linear feet of 10 to 12 inch diameter water main and the pump house station, installation of one or two water storage tanks for a total of 120,000 gallon capacity at the existing Forest Springs water storage tank site will also be needed. The district prepared a draft initial study and mitigated negative declaration or ISMND in compliance with the California Environmental Quality Act state guidelines. The 30-day public review period commenced on April 28th, 2023 and ended May 29th, 2023. During that period, we did receive four comment letters. Um, those are included in the draft ISMND with responses as well. 
And after that public review period, uh, the district worked with Panorama Environmental Inc. to respond to all those comments, create a mitigation monitoring reporting program, and finalize the ISMND. Um, unfortunately, it looks like the ISMND was not attached as Exhibit A in the memo, but it was included in the link to, on the website page. So hopefully everyone was able to find that. Um, Garrett Peterson from Panorama Environmental and myself are ready to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, why don't we start with you? See what questions you have on this. So first question is, this doesn't look like there's any money or expenditure tied to this. We're just adopting a study that's already done. Exactly. Okay. Um, do you believe the study that is done is adequate to meet the needs to move forward with the rest of the project? Yes. And it also uh, appears that we have responded to all the comments that we received. Um, so we should be all set with the mitigation measures and everything for the project. Okay. 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 Jamie? Um, how long do you, are we doing the mitigation and monitoring uh, reporting for the duration of the project, or is it for the duration of the period that the tanks are in use? Right. So it's just for the construction period. Um, but what it would look like is pretty much anytime we have any ground disturbance, especially in any vegetated areas, we would have a biologist on site. Um, during certain seasons, we do have to complete nesting bird surveys, bat surveys, bee surveys. Um, so there's some different pieces depending on the time of year when we go into construction that we'll have to complete. Um, and we also did have some pre-vegetation uh, surveys of the site to ensure that there wasn't any uh, special habit or special type plants out there. Mm -hmm. And so those those programs are factored into the overall cost of the project? Unfortunately, no. So that would be a separate cost. So when we actually go to construction, we would bid out the work separately to have a biologist on the project. Okay. Thank you. But neither of those are we deciding tonight. No, I understand. Yeah. I just was trying to understand the parameters of what that program looks like. Okay. Uh, Gail? Um, yeah, this this looks. Um, I was very pleased at how the the comments were not extensive. Um, I mean, people looked at it carefully, obviously, because they even caught little minor errors. Um, and then you responded uh, well with Panorama. So I think we've done a really thorough job here, and we're definitely, um, you know, going um, beyond. Well, not beyond, but we're definitely meeting the requirements, uh, the environmental requirements for this. So I, I feel I feel pretty good about it. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I, as always, I find it interesting who responds to these, which is mostly other agencies, mm -hmm. not really the public. I mean, from the public's point of view, it's like, we need to do this. They need the water. They need the pipe. You know, what's the problem? So the, the 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 granular part of the review comments I always find pretty interesting. Um, just to make sure that I understand the MMRP program, that's basically just having the biologist on site. Right. So there's there's different mitigation uh, measures outlined in those MMRPs, and it is project dependent. Um, so this one it it has pretty typical ones where it's biological. Um, nesting bird surveys, bee surveys, bat surveys, depending on the time of the year, vegetation surveys, and then the biological monitor on site, depending on the type of work happening. And are they on site the entire work day for the entire construction period? It's really just dependent on um, when there's ground disturbance. So they could be there part of the day. It doesn't have to be the whole day. It's really when they're just doing that initial groundbreaking work and making sure there's nothing there. Um, and then usually they're on call as well. So if something was to come up, they would be able to come back to the site. I mean, we're putting in a fair amount of pipe. Right. And a lot of it's in the roadway, thankfully. So that, that gives us a little Can leeway. Can put all of it in the roadway? <laughs> That's a good question for Rick, probably. I mean, I, I, <laughs> Most of it, I believe, is, yeah. I mean, we're kind of doing that with other projects, yeah, it's, right? It's predominantly in the road right away. I think there's one short little, like, 100-foot section where we're crossing up in Four Springs, uh, but uh, it's all moved into the roadway. And so that's that 100 foot section that is the only part we would really need the biologist for. As far as I know, not unless we run into a some type of culvert stream crossing, which I don't believe there was anything identified like that. So yeah. most likely, yes. 
and now and there's also um, a bridge two bridge crossings that may require something i'm not sure um but we'll uh, uh i think the construction plans don't because we're up out of the out of the repairing corridor so we should be okay way. there mm -hmm. so, so for the most do, part no okay so 100 feet two bridge crossings that's basically it. Right. that's basically it yeah. And most do require a training program for all uh, crew that's on site. So initially, before the project kicks off, we'll do a training with the the crews of the contractor. The contractor crews, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Um, okay. So the the additional cost for this sounds relatively modest, but currently not covered by the grant. Right. I guess it depends on what we end up with with the grant funding. Um, if well, we're they're already, we're right, we're, I think we're going to work through it pretty quickly. Yeah, we're actually. already short. I mean, yeah. that's that's no question about that. Mm -hmm. And we do need to get that funding mechanism square before we start getting into the some way or the other the, the ratepayers of the current San Lorenzo Valley Water District can't fund this. Right. So that's correct. Okay. Um, I did have a couple other questions on the ice and the B itself. And this again, just probably my ignorance here, but it doesn't sound like we need um, uh, the incidental take permit, or we do. We do not. And Garrett can jump in here. Um, we did do a pre-construction vegetation survey, and I don't believe anything was found. The same um, thing with the uh, frog, the F Y L. Right. Yeah, we shouldn't have any red-legged frogs or the yellow red-legged yellow -legged frogs. Yeah. Okay. So no ITP is required there. Because that looked pretty substantial. That you know, work stoppage mm -hmm. is it's like right. no no good. Right. Okay. And then I, there was a question about um, pipe abandonment. Um, you know, I I know and historically we haven't removed pipes. We've we sort of capped them, right? I mean, is the highway department saying that we got to remove them? I think that's site specific. I I know there may be some pipe up in Brackenbrae and Forest Springs that are, is above ground. Oh yeah, well, that, that they want or removed. Sure. But most of the time, it's like you say, we, we plug, cement plug yeah. uh, and so forth. Um, we haven't seen the Caltrans permit yet. Uh, they're just getting ready to apply. Until we get the Caltrans permit back, there may be, you know, no two permits are the same. You get different inspectors, require different things. But we would push back on any significant pipe in the I mean, the, the disruption to remove the pipe off a roadway would be worse than capping it off and the risks associated with that. Yeah, it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, they, you know, we just have to wait till we see the encroachment. If the county doubtful would require that, yeah. you never know of Caltrans. And we should be receiving the encroachment permit on the lower section of 236 any day. So that'll give us a good indication of what they're going to ask on the upper section. Okay. So we'll know more here shortly. Yeah, because we are going to be putting some pipe in 236 for the um, lion. Right? right, and that's, that's the approach permit should be here any day, and there's yeah. already construction. Okay. Um, and Nicole um, uh, got her questions answered, so she's she's happy, and Karen mm -hmm. as well. Right. Okay. And I believe they might be on this call as well. So. Yeah, I think I saw yeah. Karen um, before. And plus, we meet with Nicole and Four Springs again tomorrow to talk about the outcome of this meeting and to continue on the project. Okay. Definitely want to make sure that they remain very happy with what's mm -hmm. happening in support of this. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I want to point out uh, one thing on the on the noise impacts that I picked up on, uh, which may be significant in particular to uh, residents. Uh, the uh, ISMND points out that uh, we're going above and beyond uh, for noise impacts because we're choosing to not take an exemption that we could as a water purveyor, uh, and instead we are uh, abiding by county noise ordinance. Uh, regulations and uh maybe rick you can well, tell us what we're you know, doing that's that's that noise problem. is is probably the most inquiries that were received and that has to do with the, the pump station located at um, 236 and ridge mm -hmm. we go uh, the extra mile on noise reduction i mean this will be a concrete structure um, we will use all uh, noise dampening louvers doors venting the generator will be uh, installed inside the uh, concrete building. 
uh, with uh, noise reducing mufflers and so forth. But it is a concern. You know, we have pump stations next to people's homes from one end of the valley to the other. We have 26 of them, plus or minus. Um, and it's always a concern, and we usually successfully um, work through that and, and work with the customers. Uh, I think the, uh, the closest customer is 70 feet uh, from this pump station, according to uh, the ISMND. Um, it appears that noise may be a bit of an issue during construction, but we're talking about noise blanketing uh, blankets. Um, there'd be more noise during construction than operations. Uh, a great deal of input and thought goes into design on noise reduction. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, we've received the most comments from Fish and Game that Bob was recognizing. Um, I see that we are taking uh, measures in response to their comments. Um, uh, in your mind, or have you checked with Fish and Game or the measures that we're taking then um, sufficient to, to have them? Be. Yes, we pretty much responded to each one, um, right. and they, they're pretty, that's a very standard yes. response that we would receive from that agency. So we should have met all the requirements okay. for the measures. Good. Thank you. Um, and since uh, we've already mentioned uh, Nicole and Karen Vitali, uh, I wanted to also say thank you for your comments on that. Uh, it improved the accuracy of the document uh, for the comments that they uh, input to us. So uh, good job on providing those. So uh, I'd like to, uh, before I go out to the public again, make a motion on this. Um, Mark, just one more thing. Um, we're, we're doing something similar on noise reduction with the Redwood Park tank, right? The, the swim tank replacement. Correct. And Pretty much everything we build. And, and when will that be complete? The Redwood Park tank? The, the, the pump, pump station in particular. And where it's going to have to look at our budget and see what phase um, that comes in. Uh, the pipeline just being completed, and I think we go right into the tank. But I'd have to look at it. Yeah. The reason for that is that that would be, I think, a good example of what noise reduction we do do. Yeah. If someone wants to dive into it deeper to understand mm -hmm. what our design yeah. is all about, we can point them to that. Good idea. Right. Okay. Um, I'd like to uh, make the motion that the board adopt this initial study and mitigated ne negative declaration uh, for the consolidation of Bracken Bray and Forest Springs. I'll second that. Okay. Um, from the general public then, um, I'd like to see if there are any comments on this. Um, I do see one uh, online, Alina Lang. Hi there, Alina Lang, Boulder Creek. Um, I live in Forest Springs where the pump house um, is going. And also I was Josh Wolf's neighbor and also worked with the e e committee. So uh, just my condolences there, definitely miss. Um, but I'm here tonight because a lot of my neighbors have come to me with their concerns regarding the pump house and, and asked that I attend the meeting. Um, they're really worried about the pump house operating noise. I know you touched about a bit on that tonight. And but in the initial study and mitigation, the only the generator noise was listed, uh, but not the normal operating noise. Uh, so there was really no way to, to answer that question. And this lot over there, it's his own parks and it's been used unofficially. So, I mean, this is a lot where a lot of kids go and ride their bikes to be safe off the street. You know, now it's it's turned into this huge staging area. It's really noisy with back off backup alarms going off all day that you can hear all throughout the neighborhood. The pike stacks have collapsed, creating dangerous situations. And none of these materials are safely secured behind a fence. Um, and if it, it, the activity has really ramped up, actually, since the comment period is closed and it's bringing it more to the forefront of people's minds. And I just want to note that comments from this board have been made about not supporting other consolidations because of the impact it would be on the current customers. And, you know, this this project is currently impacting people that are current customers. Um, so the couple of people that wanted me to bring some questions forward is how long, loud is the baseline operating noise going to be? I don't know. How much is this lot costing that you're purchasing from HeartMath? Um, is there no other burn site lots available for purchase that could house this type of equipment? 
And uh, why wasn't everyone being impacted by this notified? Like I got a notice at my end of the street and my neighbor who can hear the backup beepers just a few houses down, they weren't notified. And then what is like the long-term use for this site? Is this going to be a continual staging site for equipment and a lot of people in and out? And um, if this moves forward, uh, the neighbors are asking, can they have something pretty on the walls, like a mural? And that is that is all. Um, that's uh, quite a list of questions uh, <laughs> that you uh, presented us. Um, I would like to address some of that. Sure, okay, Molly. please. Um, Alina, those were all really great comments. And there's the, the project that this, um, IS and MND is talking about has nothing to do, or the environmental review has nothing to do with the staging of all of the pipe and material in that big lot. That pipe and material that you see staged there, the contractor, a contractor who's on a different project for the district, the 2021 pipeline, rented that property because he couldn't find another place to store pipe and material. That pipe and material that you see there in equipment is part of the Blue Ridge project, is part of several other mainline projects in North Boulder Creek, and had nothing to do with this environmental review. We have had received complaints and we are working with the contractor, but the district really had nothing to do with him, that contractor renting that property. That was something the contractor did with HeartMath. Um, just like right now, we've got contractors looking for lots all over Boulder Creek to store pipe for several of our, of our big projects. So that really has nothing to do with uh, the environmental review and the project for Springs and Brackenbrae consolidation. Although, you know, it's very easy to believe that it does because it's right there. You know, the pump station is going to go tucked away in the corner at Ridge in 236, and, and I do believe that, you know, that building, uh, you know, has a footprint of like 15 by 25, and then there's a, a propane tank. So there are two, two complete different issues there. Um, but I understand your noise complaint, and um, we are working with the contractor because he does have, in his contract with the district, he does have hours of operation. And he was starting earlier and Josh was working with him. And then he was uh, following the rules. And now I understand last week, they started getting there and staging earlier. So we will address uh, that noise issue and we will address the safety issue. Okay. But it's two different projects. Um, okay, that, that clarifies a lot for that. I think a lot of people are more upset about the in and out right now than the actual pump station so sure and you know we can talk about the colors and so forth with the neighbors at, at a later date of the pump station usually i think it, it will be planned either be a tan like a split face uh, block pump station um and it will be it, it won't be in the middle of that big lot it is tucked away in the corner and we have not negotiated a price with heart math uh, as of yet, until uh, the ISNND is is approved and um, legal counsel is getting up to speed on that. We did contact, I do believe, three other property owners in that general area that had uh, locations that we did want to put a pump station or the pump station would work. The, uh, they adamantly refused and the district would have had to uh, either think about intimate domain or move to a different location. Heart Math agreed right away when we first asked. And so we went with the homeowner or property owner that was agreeable. Okay. Because we don't like eminent domain. We don't like eminent domain. No, I, I, oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> we don't. Okay. Thank you, Rick. Uh, seeing no other uh, respondents with questions, I'd like to put this to a I'm sorry, I, I see a hand up. Uh, comment? Sure. Uh, um, what Alina said was basically <coughs> a compilation of what all of the neighbors, I'm kind of informally <coughs> representing about 20 neighbors, and depending on how you count them, whether it's by household or, or properties, 
That's excuse me. Could you identify oh, yourself, I'm sorry. please? Eric Martin. I'm from Boulder Creek and about 150 feet from the proposed pump station. Um, just to start off, my wife has sleep issues. Um, I was talking to Josh and my condolences with Josh. We were having some back and forth and it was friendly and professional. And I, my condolences, I don't, I don't have anything else other than just that. That's just such a horrible thing. The environmental impact is great. I mean, it's covering the birds and the fish and the lizards, but there is isn't there is no mention of any environmental noise that is gonna be produced by the pump house. And I had back and forth with Josh as to what the decibel ratings were. And we, we couldn't come up with enough, he couldn't come up with enough. And so what you're asking us is to accept this on blind faith that it's gonna be fine. We're already living in an area that's impacted by, by public noise, for most of the day. And the only peace and quiet we get is after 10 or 11 o'clock at night during the week. And now you're asking us to sit, and he told me that that pump station was gonna be uh, in service 24 seven, 365, and with no schedule, no timers to turn the pumps on or off during the, during the sleeping hours. It's an on-demand issue. Um, that to me is a problem because that means I'm gonna have to sleep with my doors and windows closed. Um, the other thing is, is that lot, that is proposed is 25 feet wide by 100 feet, I think. Uh, if your building is 15 feet wide and 25 feet long, um, there's gonna be zoning issues, setbacks and everything else. And absent more information to us to be comfortable with this, there's probably gonna be litigation. And it's not a threat, it's just that we, this is only, this is, this only benefits the Bracken Bray and the Forest Springs people. It doesn't, I've got water, my water turns on, it works fine. But you're asking us to take a risk on environmental noise for somebody who's up the road. Let them have the pump house on their properties or somewhere near their properties. But I, like I said, I, I had a whole bunch of questions, but Alina got to most of them. And this is just a kind of a comment that Without more information, it's gonna be hard to say, yeah, we're gonna sign on to this. And, and I know that the details are still to come, but the environmental impact and the noise section off of your own thing had nothing about after construction noise. This was only construction period noise. And we can deal with short-term noise, we can deal with that for years, but to have something that's gonna be there long after I'm gone, is something that I think requires a lot more thought and information processes for the people that live in that area. And I can honestly say there are a lot of people in the area that are nervous about coming here and standing up in front of a, a microphone or a TV, but we're, we're trying to do this through the, the proper channels as opposed to going willy nilly with our hair on fire. Thank you. Can I address that please? please. You know, I, I, I think what what would be a, uh, a good idea is that you and I uh, go out, and I'll take you out to very similar pump stations. Yes, the pump will be in operation, will be operational 24, 365, but the demand in those two zones are only about a four hour a day runtime on the pump. Yes, the pump will come on at any time, you know, for fire flow and, you know, everybody does things differently. And it may run six hours one day and maybe run only an hour the next day. But it's estimated that through the demand that, that we count, it will run about four hours a day. Um, but it will be able to come on at any time as needed, especially for five day fire flow, right? And every zone has a pump station. Right? Everybody has a pump. Your pump station is down next to somebody else's house. Um, all of our zones, but I can take you out to very similar pump stations, very similar designs take an afternoon or a morning and let you see and hear and then take that. I mean, I, I have no problem doing that. I've done that so many times with people um, and spend some time to get you comfortable. I'm more interested in, in actual the empirical evidence. I wanna know what the DBA is. Well, I, we can get that. Uh, we can get that. Oh, so I, I can get a sound meter that we can take. And I couldn't this. find it in the document either. I found construction noise, but I couldn't find the actual operational noise. But 
I live with his documents today. Like so. I said, my it's, wife has sleep issues, and sure. I know a couple other folks in the neighborhood that do have sleep issues. And how much noise does that pump make when it when it comes on online? Sure. Um, cavitation from a centrifugal pump is significant, the right? There are on the yeah. And uh, as you as you read, what are there fifteen mm -hmm. more pumps? Uh, only one mm -hmm. will run at a time. It's mostly generated. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's let me get you some more information. And if you can, I can get your name and uh, contact. Um, that'd be great. Okay. And um, Rick, to your point about uh, generally runs maybe four hours a day. Um, if it's on demand of water use, uh, is it not likely to run at night and much more likely to run it well, during the day? When to be honest is? with you, you know, now when we size our pump, our, our, our water storage, they're sized so we can go time of use. And because we get okay. a much less PG&E so, rate. Right now, well, when time of use well, in this area is, most likely it'll be at night. Yeah. It'll be off peak, and we can look at that. Okay. Um, but I, I'm pretty confident that noise will not be an issue. So, do we have a block building? Yes, several of them. Then that we can several of them. Okay, then we can come into it. That's a good first step, then I think. Yeah. And specifically, the pump station. That's why I was asking the question earlier about the uh, tank park and other areas that might have um, similar pumps. So specifically, you're going to be showing him pump stations that have uh, substantially similar specifications around pump size, correct construction, and that sort of thing. Yeah. So it's going to be an apples to apples type yeah. view. Yeah. And if necessary, we could get a noise meter on it to be able to measure. I'm, I'm pretty system. confident, but I'm pretty confident too. Um, our engineering design team at Sandus, who's designing the pump station, can come up with yeah. engineering yeah. documents. Yeah. Or the noise meter. Yeah. 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 And, and a comparison, and I, and I will make sure of that. We have two pump stations, one in Scenic and Highway 9, and one at um, the North, or the uh, Felton Intertie, which is right down the street from that. Right. Um, so they're very similar to what the design will be, residential neighborhoods, and um, if you would like to go out, I will, but I will definitely, yeah, I'll definitely order um, Sandus to produce engineering data on the operational noise because it, it sounds like you have some background in this or you understand how to read this kind of um well, information i'm a retired airline captain close enough and a mechanic okay i've been around hydraulic pumps all my life sure and without taking i don't want to say extraordinary measures they're noisy beasts especially centrifugal pumps and all of the neighbors, they're they're kind of intimidated by the parliamentary procedure thing. And, um, I'm a cap. I'm, I'm a, like I said, retired captain. I'm an eighty. I can talk in front of eighty, and so I do. But my concerns are: is are the startup noise? Because everybody talks about running noise, or they talk about construction noise, but nobody talks about those details. Like when that pump first kick, first that fifteen horsepower motor kicks on, and that pump starts spinning. If the pressure head isn't high enough. On the input, mm -hmm. that pump's going to cavitate. Right. And, well, and that's why they start up under a closed valve. And then the automatic valve slowly opens so it doesn't cavitate. Before it shuts off, the automatic valve closes and puts a positive head. So it shuts down by the time. But, so this is, this is not in any. So let's. But yeah, it sounds like. Yeah, we, we, can, we can get together. Follow up discussions. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get together and, and yeah. I'll show you what we have. Right, yeah. that you can then take back to some of your neighbors, yeah, based on what you see and, and hear from Rick. Then, well, the, yeah. it's the Forest Springs area, right? And at least the Forest Pool area is there. It's probably one of the most popularly, heavily populated areas in North North Boulder Creek, yeah. uh, simply because the the houses are right next to each other, and this has the most environmental effect to, and I can think of. Five or six households within a hundred feet of that pr proposed stunt pump station who are retired folks. And and the the, the noise complaints with the with the contractor that's there, that was me. When I get woken up at 6 30 in the morning because of backup noise. Yeah, I, I, that's totally unacceptable. I you know, I can handle that. 
but the point is, is this has already started. The process is is creating a lot of disbelief and distrust in the in the in the community. And if you can't control the contractor who's doing work at, at your behest, then how are you going to control the process as it goes on? Um, and that's that's our concern. Is we don't get any peace and quiet as it is, and now we're going to have a pump station that's maybe going to take what little we have left and evaporate it. So Rick has offered uh, have some follow-up discussion. I'd like to wrap up that discussion or tonight's discussion here and let him speak with you then uh, okay. afterwards. Okay. All right. Um, I do see that. Um, yeah, it looks like Garrett Peterson, who uh, actually wrote the document, wanted to jump in here. There is a section on operational noise, but it looks like it really just addresses the generator. It's very. It light. doesn't address I, exactly the pumps. I, I agree with the comment. Uh, but let's see what Garrett has to say here, if, There's if nothing you don't mind. On operation. I was looking for that also. Yeah, go ahead, Garrett. Uh, you, you stole my thunder, because that uh, is sorry. exactly <laughs> what I was going to say. Okay. Um, and, and so the reason why we did focus on the generator noise is because that would be the, the maximum noise from the pump station. So we wanted to find out the maximum impact. And so uh, with that being said, uh, the project would adhere to the county noise standards. And so the noise standard uh, for nighttime would be 60 decibels. And that's comparable to a normal conversation. And at night, that could that could be loud. You could hear that at your uh, fence line. Uh, but like Rick had has said previously, given the design of the structure and some of the measures that the building would have to reduce the noise itself, uh, such as the, the structure itself is going to be a cement, and there'd also be mufflers on the vents. Uh, we believe that it would be below that 60 decibel nighttime threshold. Uh, which would be a requirement uh, for the design of the structure itself. And so uh, as far as meeting the county standards, we believe that this project would do that. Understand that. Okay. Yeah, and, just, and if I can add real quick, um, I did pull up from the Redwood Park tank, which we had a pump station as well installed there. They did um, some conservative modeling is how they addressed it, but they said it was approximately 43 dBA. Uh, from the pump house station. And what distance? Um, that is at a distance of tank site property line. I don't know if Rick, you know what the tank site property line is. 25 feet, 30 feet. Probably 25. Okay. It's a very small line. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, let's 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 have that discussion that Rick is offering after the to look at to look at an existing facility which I think is the best demonstration of what we have. Okay. Thank you for that then. Um, we have a motion on the table in front of us. Uh, Holly. President Smalley. Yes. Vice President Hill. Yes. Vice President Ackman. Yes. Vice President, I mean, excuse me. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of vice presidents. Right. Are false. No, we have to get rid of the mid-level management. There's too many vice presidents. It's okay. So I'll take a demotion. Yes. Yeah. Director Mayhood. Yes. Okay. Motion passes. Moving on then. Um, the next item is the emergency construction management. Emergency construction management contract Quail Hall. Yes, thank you, Mark. Um, as you all know, that um, the district has been working on Quail Hollow Road. We uh, just recently installed a, um, a large 12 inch uh, distribution main um, and completed that project. And then, when the atmospheric river rainfall uh, storms came, the roadway failed uh, around the pipe uh, and in our trench. Um, the district uh, went out immediately and plated the road about uh, 200 feet, a roadway um, that caved in. 
uh, wasn't, I think it was our last board meeting, the board approved a uh, T&M uh, contract uh, with uh, Anderson Pacific to do emergency repairs uh, to the roadway. Um, our district engineer, Josh Wolf, was the uh, project manager on that project, um, who, is a, who was a PE. Um, with his departure, we no longer had a PE on that project, which we needed to design the um, underdrain system and submit to the county for approval uh, and to monitor that construction. Um, I went out and procured the services of um, MME Civil and Structural Engineering, who has worked and does have contracts with the district right now, like on the fish ladder, and contracted with them to manage that project with a not to exceed $50,000. Um, I'm asking uh, the board uh, to authorize the expenditure of time materials, not to exceed $50,000 for project manager management of the failed water line trench in Quail Hollow Road in accordance with the attached contract. Okay. All right. Um, Jamie, any questions on this? No. Uh, Gail, any questions on this item? Seems like it's something that we have to do. So that's all. Yeah. Well, I, it just so I'm clear, has the contract been executed already? Or yes, yes, it has. Uh, Anderson Pacific was already on the project and working. County was wanting a uh, plans to resolve the problem because of all the steel plates on the roadway and the road was getting worse in certain sections with the amount of groundwater. So I executed the contract with uh, uh, MME and Ken came to the board immediately. Because you're, the typical is like 30,000, right? For that is my that is my limit. Um, but was there a possibility of being able to do a 30,000 initial and then? I probably could have done 30 and then come back to the board again, um, but I didn't. I. I I needed them to move right in, and we need to get this. I get their moving the right in. Yeah, that's why the thirty thousand. No, I, I hear you. Okay, thanks. Is is there any chance that this is going to run over fifty? No, I would think that it's going to be under fifty because the county accepted the proposal from MME uh, drain pipe that they put in. Um, they have a great relationship working with the county. They've designed a lot of their drainage. Anderson Pacific is on the job. I'm hoping that um, that we come in under the, the 50,000. Because the construction management part of it now is, is minor because we have a good diagram of what we're doing. It's just an underground system. Is, this is principally to meet the county requirement that we have a PE on the job. For design, they wouldn't accept a design not a, that wasn't stamped by a PE. Which I don't blame them. Yeah, I wouldn't either. No, yeah, no, exactly. No, exactly. I'm <laughs> yeah. just yeah. yeah. Um, so, to to the point of, of the cost, this might be half of that. Then. Could be, okay. or could yeah. for some right. reason it could be over that. You know, I'm not gonna. I mean, just for a matter of protocol, I, you know, I, I we've had the number of these emergencies, and I, I get that. But in a right. case like this, where we could have done a 30k. And a follow up if necessary. That's a better way to go from the point of view of following the policy. Yes. Yes. I, 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 I could have. Yes. I could have done a 30K under my limit and not bring it to the board. And then I could have done a 20. But we I do believe our purchasing procedure I, says that we yeah. have not have, split. No, no, but you could have done the 30. And then if they needed more, then, you then come on. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. because the policy does not. It doesn't want you to piggyback like that, right? Exactly. Um, I'm just saying from a, I don't want to, I don't want these to be a hassle. Procedurally, you're right, Bob. Yeah, absolutely. Point taken. Right. Agreed. Um, and I do want to point out that we were doing all of this uh, project management, construction management in-house. We no longer have that ability. Uh, Josh's loss and the fact that he had he was able to do the design. And this is a design that's um, somewhat on the fly based on um, what we're seeing in the field. And based on what we're seeing in the field, here's what we think as a PE will work. 
in passing that threat. That's correct. No, and, and, and I, I do agree with Director Foltz. Uh, you know, I mean, my urgency was to get this moving because we had the contractor already on the job from the other emergency contract that um, was approved by the board. Right. But um, do you have any feel that MME wouldn't have, wouldn't have participated if it was? Well, I think they would have. Okay. I think they would have. Okay. Then, yeah. You know, I, I don't see that. I just wanted to move through it. We've had, we have so much going on right now and trying to cover projects that I understand. I didn't want to, yeah, I wanted to get, take care of this project but, and move on to the next. Right. But they would have, they would have, they yes, would have been would've. participating now. Mm -hmm. um, yes, they would. Just a question on the, uh, we, we did approve uh, hiring a construction engineer, right? The, the inspector. Inspector, right. right. Is, is that, he's not a PE. He's not, he would not be. A and he was on that project with Josh. He was doing the day-to-day -day inspection um, and uh, working on that. And Josh was being the PE and working with the county on that. So they were doubling up on that project. I, can I just, um, this conversation for me raises the question about whether the um, uh, uh, emergency spending authority that we have allocated to the general manager is appropriate. And so not something that we can talk about here, obviously, but I wonder if we shouldn't think about raising that at some point. I think 30,000 sounds low to me. Mm -hmm. Well, it was five <laughs> and we raised it to 30. So I don't know. I, it's something to address something to address like the budget yeah. at a future the meeting uh, can we leave it as Rick if you feel that you have the need for future just put that on as an agenda item as, as I think Jamie is suggesting before we you need it another time so <laughs> yeah. think about that between now and the next meeting if you want to I agree Okay. Yeah, well, we're going to go through this you know, very shortly on another item. Exactly. <laughs> no, we're going to do the same thing. Okay. Right. I don't think we need okay. to do it again. Um, I don't think we need to do it again. Then um, I'd like to make the motion that we direct the district manager. So, what, what, wait a sec. We're not directing to execute it. We're directing. We're ratifying the contract that is already. Yeah. Uh, yes. Right. Yeah. Executed. So that's slightly different language, but it's still important because it reflects the reality of where we are. Yes. Correct. Yeah. I agree. Um, we're ratifying the contract. To um, ratify the contract with. Yes. With MME civil and structural for an amount not to exceed fifty thousand for the purpose of of project management of the failed potable water main trench in Quail Hollow Road. Second. Okay. Did I hear a second? Second. You did. Uh, so uh, any questions or comments from members of the public on this item? Uh, seeing none, we will move on then. Okay. Uh, Holly. President Smalley. Yes. Vice President Hill. Yes. Director Ackman. Yes. Director Foles. Yes. Director Mayhood. Yes. Okay. Um, moving on then to uh, the next uh, emergency contract. Uh, being uh, for the Blue Ridge. Uh, right. This is similar to the, to the last one. And yes, I'll be asking the board to ratify a contract that I've already entered into with MME uh, not to exceed $50,000 for project management of the Blue Ridge water tank replacement project um, for the attached uh, contract. Uh, the district is in construction of uh, replacement of the Blue Ridge tank, which is a redwood tank located in the Blue Ridge Drive area in North Boulder Creek. Uh, the district engineer, uh, Josh, was project manager on this project with uh, project inspection done by our in-house inspector. Um, 
with the loss of Josh, we definitely need a PE uh, on this project due to the fact there is considerable structural on the foundation um, and um, compaction. Um, I'm asking the board to ratify the, this contract with ME not to exceed $50,000. Okay. Um, any other business? Pretty much the same set of questions and issues that we had previously. Uh, Gail, any questions on this one? No, I don't see the point. It's pretty much the same thing. <laughs> um, yeah, almost. So just so I'm clear, that there's this is part of the 2019 project. Well, it's part of the 2021 CIP uh, projects. There's the Blue Ridge tank, and there's several main. Well, but there's, there's mains. I thought the Blue Ridge was part of the 2019. I think it's 2021. It's 2021 CIP yeah. pipeline project. Yes. Um, and I'm just the only and the the rest of the 2021 projects, all of the pipelines and so forth, our in-house inspector will handle those. We do not need PE on that. Um, so he's handling um, all of the other parts of this. So just for the tank. Part it's just for the tank the because structure. there is pipeline going in as well. Right. There's a lot of pipeline going yeah. in. Yeah. It's a ton. <laughs> More than a mile. Yes. Yeah, we're yeah, like mile and a half. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, Jeff. Same basically issue, the same comments. Yeah. Jamie. Same. Same thing. Okay. All right. I I would comment that until we have a replacement, we're probably going to for Josh. This won't be the last one of these. We'll see. We're covered pretty well right now, but I can guarantee you that I won't. It's been over $30,000 without coming to the board. Now that we've had the. Um, okay. Um, we're using MME uh, on both of these um, <laughs> that we need emergency contract on. Uh, are they able to uh, utilize forces? Uh, since they're now doing two jobs at once for us, the jobs are both concurrent and ongoing. Um, rather than you have gone out to two different firms, is there a cost benefit to the district having all of this with MME? Are, are they do they have the ability? Are they all sympathetic to our to our issues at this point and why we're coming to? Them? I don't think that has anything to do with price. I think that the sympatheticness is that they made staff available for okay. us. And, and just for clarification, MEE is also on the fish ladder as project manager. Okay. Um, and, but they brought in a, a, an additional engineer in for Blue Ridge mm -hmm. and um, the fish ladder doesn't take an, an eight hour a day inspection. So the inspector who is a PE and the principal at MME uh, are on the Quail Hollow project. Um, so I think there's the sympatheticness is they made time available. I see. And I didn't want to bring, you know, some of the other contractors in because those are the ones that designed. They want to bring the design engineer on no, the bridge in to inspect their own work and, and so forth. So I was okay. conscious of that. Okay. Um, then I'd like to use the same language. Uh, that I just did for the previous one that uh, Director Tolls provided uh, with uh, ratifying a contract that we've already entered uh, with MME, uh, civil and structural, again, for not to exceed 50,000 for the Blue Ridge water tank replacement project. Second. So, okay, second. Uh, any comments from the general public on this? Seeing none. Um, okay, Holly. President Smalley. Yes. Vice President Hill. Yes. Director Ackman. Yes. Director Foles. Yes. Director Mayhood. Yes. Okay. Uh, moving on from new business. Um, we now talk about the uh, award notification for the Urban Community Drop Relief Program. I'm sorry, you missed one item. 4E. 
DWR funding. That is it. Oh, <laughs> he said new business. So that was oh, I'm sorry. Um, that is under new business. Yes. Is it? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm confused. <laughs> Think so. <laughs> okay. Um, this and the, the uh, environmental plant program manager, Troy Blanchard, will present this item to the board. Great. Thank you, Rick. Um, so the Department of Water Resources, or DWR, uh, 2022 Urban Community Drought Relief Funding opened in December of 2022, and proposals were accepted until January 31st, 2022. Uh, the program had a $3 million minimum award for applicants and a 25% non-cost share, and all award funds were to be spent by December 31st of 2026. Uh, the district submitted an application for a replacement of five redwood tanks that are currently leaking and undersized with 120 gallon bolted steel tanks. The application also included one polyethylene tank that was undersized and damaged in the 2020 CZU fire. And the grant total of request was $4.5 million with a total project cost of $6 million. Tanks submitted as part of the application were outlined in the memo. Um, and then each tank was costed out about a million dollars to replace for a total project request of $6 million. On June 12, 2023, the district was contacted by DWR with the news that the district was awarded the full request of $4.5 million in funding for all the tank replacements. Uh, this is an informational item, but we're ready to answer any questions. Okay. Great news. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions on this? No? Yes, Jeff. Um, so we got the word on this on June 12th. Carly, is this in the budget we're going to be looking at tonight or not? It is not. I didn't think so. Yeah. So. The timing of everything just didn't allow no. to. So in thinking about the budget later, we need yeah. to keep in mind that there's four and a half million dollars. Right. More there and then a million and a half that we have to spend. Right. Okay. Jamie. Um, under the environmental impact section, you mentioned um, that it, we need to do additional um, CEQA analysis on, I, I assume, uh, one analysis for each of the remaining tanks. That's correct. Is, is that an additional cost? Is that a cost factored into the um, uh, grant award? Is that? I believe we counted that as our cost share. So any money that we spend towards the project that isn't the actual construction of the project, I believe, is what we're using as the cost share. So that's our part of our 1.5 million. Exactly. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, no, just uh, echo that this is wonderful news. Yeah, this is very good news. And I think this is like the, um, one of the last big grant um, determinations we were waiting for, right? Mm -hmm. um, at another time, we'll talk about the pipeline. Uh, not tonight, but I am interested in the pipeline. Um, my only question this is December 31st, 2026. So I see we have to see what's complete for two, um, but not for the others. And um, what happens if we aren't done by December 31st, 2026? There's most likely a, an option for us to get an extension, but ideally we finish out the grant prior to that. Um, well, no, ideally, but as yeah, we've seen, we will, hopefully. We're, we're still wrapping up a pipeline that was out of 2019. And I, even though I know the fire got in the way of things and all that, but things happen and things take time. Yeah. Um, that's three and a half years, more or less. Yeah, as soon as we sign that grant agreement, we can start moving the other pieces forward, like the sequels that are remaining, or the reviews that are remaining for the other projects. The Felton Heights tank, we do have a consultant ready on board for CEQA, so we're just waiting right now to select that site, um, and that'll probably be one of the pieces that we need to work through sooner than later, um, and it's in process. Okay. Um, and about how long does it take to construct each tank? That's probably a question that Rick would be able to answer better than I. You know, the actual construction goes quick. It's like the CEQA and uh, moving ahead and the bidding and all, it takes the time. Yeah, you know, I'd say probably a year from start to finish by the time we got water going in the tank, you know, with construction season and so forth. Tanks go up quick, but everything else coming to that point is very time consuming. But, you know, like Blue Ridge Tank is already moving, Belton Heights, Redwood Park, 
So some, uh, some of these projects are already way in progress. We can start, uh, we can start environmental and um, geotechnical on Highland and ECHO. We can get that going um, right away as soon as we do adjustments to the budget. Yeah, and just for the interest of full disclosure, I live right across the street from the Highland Tank. So, um, you know, if we'll probably need to revisit any conflict of interest type uh, questions. I think we've talked about that before and determined there wasn't any. Yeah, but, I, don't, I don't believe there um, is previous but, council, but yeah. I did want to mention that. I'd like to suggest that we rename the Highland Tank just in the interest of disclosure. Bob Fultz <laughs> lives across from the Highland Tank. Different <laughs> <laughs> time because you never know who is going to listen to the, yes, the, Bob, the Bob Fultz Tank. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, uh, well, we should name it the Raven Tank because the Ravens like to attack it. <laughs> uh, funny. Um, and the Felton Heights Tank. Uh, so that's really the only one that we don't have a specific site already. Right, the, the the problematic tank site will be the echo tanks because we have a very narrow property lot there and your traditional round tank of 120,000 will not fit. So we're going to have to take a look and maybe even relocate, which is never easy. Um, so that'll be the problematic one that we should start investigating right away. Okay. I don't know what that's getting closer. Somebody's cat. Close the raven. <laughs> so, I know. Um, okay, yeah, because I'm, I mean, I, the money's yeah, great. The Highland Tank is tech book. <laughs> yeah, as long as Geotech is <laughs> good, you can move right in there. And so are these other ones. But the, the Echo Tank is a very problematic tank site. Okay, great. Um, anyway, a great, um, I don't know who found this grant. Was that our grant writer? Or? It was. Yeah. Um, so yeah, let's let's talk about pipeline for, for as long as the grant money is flowing, we need to take advantage of it because it won't stay flowing forever. And we're in discussion, looking for future grants right as we speak now. And one of the pipelines, uh, the Olympico pipeline, is is one of the top of the list on pipelines. Okay. Uh -oh. We're recognizing that. Uh, one of the tanks that this covers, Blue Bridge, is already in construction. Um, what's the time frame from us signing or accepting yeah. this? So I actually believe we were allowed to start spending prior to the grant award. Yes. Um, I'd have to year. get that that the date exactly. I don't right. have it right now, but... but when can we start recovering uh, any costs? Yeah, right? yeah. as yeah. soon as we sign the grant agreement, which we've already submitted the first paperwork, which was a DocuSign authorization. Right. So now we're just waiting for the grant agreement to come to us for review, right. and then we'll have Rick uh, DocuSign it. So it could be imminent within the next several months then? We could be yes, I believe it should. I mean, if they're moving this quickly costs. with these pieces, I would assume we'd probably have it in the next month or so, the longest. Okay. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah, exciting. <laughs> A bit of good news on the financial side. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, you weren't asking for any. Uh, it's just informational uh, recommendations on that. Um, any uh, comments from the general public on this? Seeing none. Okay. Uh, then we can move on. Uh, now. Uh, if we have finished new business, we can move on to unfinished business. Uh, Holly, uh, we're now talking the uh, biennial uh, draft budget for fiscal year uh, 23 to 25. Okay. And the finance manager will present this to the board and public. Okay, so this is the final budget package for fiscal year 23-24 through 24-25 budget. Um, I'm assuming everyone had a chance to review the full package, so I'll just cover, um, you know, the main highlights of that, and then we can go to questions at the end. So for the operating revenue and expenses, operating revenue for 23-24 is 12.6 million, 11.6 million not including the fire recovery surcharge, and for 24-25, 12.7 million and 11.7 million not including the fire recovery surcharge. 
Um, operating expenses for 23-24 is 9.8 million and for 24-25, 10.3 million, uh, leaving a operating income of 2.7 million for 23-24 and 2.4 million for 24-25. Um, or 1.7 and 1.4 million, excluding the fire recovery surcharge. Non-operating revenue um, for 23-24 is 1.7 million, and for 24-25, 1.4 million. And we have total capital contributions of 10.7 million for 23-24 and 15 million for 24-25. The capital contributions um, are a blend of estimated FEMA re reimbursements and also any capital grants. Um, the capital and grants included are the Fall Creek Fish Ladder, our Water Smart AMI meter grant, the um, IRWM fire hardening and the DWR Brackenbrae Forest Springs consolidation. Uh, and like we mentioned before, it does not include the most recent award um, from the item before, but we can uh, do a budget amend amendment for that. <laughs> Non-operating expenses, uh, the majority of that is our debt and interest principal payments um, of 2.1 million for each fiscal year. Other non-operating expenses are for the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency, about 165,000 for each fiscal year, uh, bringing the total non-op expenses to 2.3 million for each fiscal year. So the high level summary um, shows a total income or law or sorry total income of 2.1 million for 23-24 and 1.7 million for 24-25 um, excluding the fire recovery surcharge it'll be 1.1 million and 700,000 for 23-24 and 24-25 respectively for the capital budget for 23-24 we have 27.1 million um, the majority of those are our loan funds or, uh, or our loan projects or our FEMA projects um, and the grant projects. And then the remaining are um, out of reserves. For 24-25, we have 11.8 million in the capital budget. And the for the statement of revenues, expenses, and changes in reserves, in 23-24, uh, we are estimating a de decrease of 2.5 million, primarily due to the capital project expenses exceeding any grant, FEMA, or debt funding uh, we received. And in 24-25, uh, is an increase of 4.2 million, uh, primarily due to our anticipated FEMA reimbursements. Debt coverage forecasts, you'll see the top one um, was the debt coverage forecast from the prior biennial budget for so fiscal year 21 through 23. And the bottom is the proposed budget for 23 through 25. Um, you'll see as of year three, um, fiscal year 25, 26, we fall below the, uh, if we exclude the fire recovery recovery surcharge fall below the 1.25 uh, debt covenants. And so uh, with the rate study, they'll they'll be looking into that and analyzing that situation. Uh, so the recommended motion would be the board of directors approve resolution, um, I guess to be determined for 22-23, adopting the biennial budget for fiscal years 2023 through 2025. Questions? Okay, uh, I'd like to start with the uh, members of the Budget Finance Committee and start off with uh, Gail as the chair of that committee. Uh, Gail? Sure. Um, well, first I wanna thank uh, Kendra um, for responding to all of the input that she got from the board and budget and finance so that we now see um, as Bob has requested for quite a while, um, we finally now have um, the surcharge uh, dealt with explicitly, um, and I think that that's great. Um, and also want to thank both Kendra and Rick for taking the time to think about the capital expenditures and spreading them out over the next five years so that we have a little bit more of a realistic uh, capture of what the activity there is is going to be. So um, this is this has been a, a huge task, and I think that um, 
I think Ken Renrick and, and the rest of the staff have done a great job of um, putting this together, and I thank you for it. Okay, Joe. So, like like Gail, I congratulate you on doing what looks like a very good job to me. Um, you have digested multiple pages of comments from me, from Gail, and from others, um, and I, by and large, it all is represented in the work you've done. So I congratulate you on that. Um, I would comment that the, the number one takeaway in my mind on this budget is that we're in trouble in two years, two, three years, because if we drop below our loan covenant coverage and uh, our gross margins, our operating margins drop way down. So it's crucial that we get the rate study done and we make whatever adjustments we need to make to uh, bring this back into line. Uh, looking at, you know, this first next year, 23, 24, we still look pretty healthy, but you move out there a couple of years and it's the budget. What you've given us is a tool that's, that, that is ringing the fire bell and saying, uh, oh, there's an alarm here, we've got to do something. Right. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Jamie? I mean, I appreciate all the work that goes into producing these documents. Um, you know, I, I, I commend you for the thought that went into it. I think it reflects all the conversations that we've been having for um, several years now. So thank you. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, I appreciate you uh, uh, answering uh, a lot of the questions that I think everybody had, had asked, including myself. Um, so we are, I think, making some real improvements in, in the budgeting. Um, and I particularly like the uh, start around creating those graphs and sources and uses mm -hmm. of funds. Mm -hmm. So I, I will have a couple of suggestions uh, here about that once I a little bit to what Jeff mentioned. So Jeff was mentioning that we have a fire alarm going off in two years. Um, well, really now. But I mean, well, I, I, I get that. Yeah. But but my point has always been about these budgets is that we have always had a fire alarm going off and that fire alarm continues to ring. And the reason that that fire alarm is ringing is because of our um, uh, operating expenses, uh, the, the trend of that, which historically has been well above inflation, combined with an operating margin that I don't believe we have as a group established what that operating margin needs to be in order for us to be sustainable relative to our infrastructure and capital requirements. Um, that operating margin had been running at about 3 million a year. Um, our, um, if you just look at our inventory and you know take the lifespan and all the rest of it, it says we should be spending somewhere around five to 6 million a year. Um, and that is a big difference. Um, we're definitely better than we were during the 90s and 2000s where darn little infrastructure spending was going on. Rates were held down artificially low, in my opinion, for political reasons uh, and had nothing to do with running the business. Uh, it's better than that, but we are still well short of where we need to be. And so that fire alarm to me goes off every time I look at this or think about it because what I want to hand off to the next generation and generations after that is something that's a lot more sustainable than, than where we are today. Um, so that's, I, I appreciate you bringing that up, that fire alarm analogy. Um, I just rang the bell a heck of a lot earlier and I've been ringing it for years. So, so I would comment that to be, to be clear, what I was attempting to say and probably didn't say is clear. The alarm is going off now. In two years, the building is pretty well burned. Yeah, it, it's been going off for years, yes, and the so building's been burning a little. Yes. Um, anyway, um, you, you know, Mark, I, I will take the time that okay. I need to take to go through this. If that's Agreed. Okay. I didn't uh, want to have Jeff interrupting. No, 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 no. no. In fact, I like right that okay. kind of back and forth. Okay. I think that is actually something that we should engage in more often. Actually, so that's great. Um, 
I, I, one of the other things I asked for last time was about the cash flow report. Is that going to be coming, do you think, or did I miss it? It's not in the budget, but I am working on a cash flow projection, which goes out five years and it'll have like a six month that I'll include in the status reports. That is really yeah. great. Yeah. That is so. going to be huge for us to make sure that we yeah, don't sure. run out of cash. Yes, right? yes, definitely. Um, especially with this whole FEMA shuffle. Right, yeah. On, right? Yeah. Um, with respect to the, um, I'm sorry, I'm going to scroll through here, so okay. it might take me a while to get there. Um, with respect to what I saw was one of your innovations, which is the source and use of funds. Mm -hmm. um, the only comment I have about that is that we're conflating operating and capital when we do that. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure that that's, that gives the right picture about the fact that we have really two different worlds that we operate in. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the operating margin flows mm -hmm. into the capital budget in a way that allows us to sustain the loans and the other projects that we have that go on. Of course, now that's buttressed by the fact that we've just recently gotten a lot of grants, which is a huge thing. But but conflating the two together, I'm not sure gives the right picture to the community. Okay. Um, and that's something that, that you may want to talk about with financial advisor or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, it's definitely moving in the right direction, having that kind of a chart, um, and, and so I, I want to say big thumbs up for that. But the, the conflation part bothered me a little, and that just maybe being a finance guy just mm -hmm. bothered me a little bit. Okay. Um, I I was a little confused about what our actual reserves were versus the sort of what I call the um, the enhanced reserves. So to me, the actual reserves are. Uh, is the cash that has not been earmarked for other things or is not a loan. Mm -hmm. um, and I wasn't sure I was reading this right on page 20 of 62. Okay. Um, is the actual cash that's not earmarked for other projects, not a loan, not the FRS and all that, is that the uh, combination, is that the 5.5 million and the 9.8 million? Correct. So, you know, that that makes up our operating reserve, which is essentially just our general reserve fund that we can use. Um, and then it, it goes by our reserve fund policy. So, you know, the the number one would be the operating reserve, which is four and a half times our operating expenses. Um, and then our compensated absences. Um, is at the 180,000 and then any remainder of that is put into the capital reserve and but then there's also you know the res restricted reserves that are you know earmarked for the specific you know the only assessment district and uh, any other debt like that so but that's actually like cash on hand that's cash yeah that we have absolutely no restrictions on how we'd be able to spend it no loans associated with it anything like that my, so minus anything that says restricted, yeah, no, anything, yeah, anything left over would be, yes, the cash on hand that we can use for whatever. Okay. And then on the surplus reserves, I'm not sure that that's not a category that I'm aware of in the reserve policy. So that's just anything left over in a, in excess of the, um, like project or the, what am I trying to say? The what's listed in the reserve fund policy. So if we're saying our operating reserve needs to be four and a half times our operating expenses, anything over that would just be put into like a surplus reserve for use of. Um, okay, so but the capital reserve is currently substantially underfunded, right? Because I think that it's at two or two and a half percent of. Um, a big number. Yeah. So in the in last last year's budget or last biennial budget, it was based on 150 million. Um, but now that the uh, master plan was completed, it was reduced by the total replacement cost, which I think was about 75 million or something like oh, that. No, that can't possibly be. So that I mean, it was it was based off of the replacement costs in the master plan, the, two and a half percent. The seven, the seventy-five million was the replacement costs only for the projects, not for the entire system that we have. 
right? The entire system we have is somewhere closer to 400 million. Okay, million. well, I then so I would need to we'll need look. To maybe look into yeah, that I'll, I'll need there. to look back into that and then. And Rick, that may be something that I can talk about offline because I, 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 I think I know where the 75 million came from. Okay. Um, on the chart on page 21, the next page, um, this looks new and it looks interesting. Mm -hmm. Could you walk us through that? Yeah, so um, this is basically showing a reconciliation for the fire recovery surcharge and um, the amount of CZU related expenses we've incurred to date, um, the total we've received from FEMA, and then the total fire recovery surcharge we've received from our customers. So in the first column in is basically all of the expenses we've incurred from the beginning of the event, the fire event, um, through June 30th. So there are some, you know, estimated actuals in there. Um, so with that, we've incurred four or, or paid out $4.7 million worth of CGU related expenses. And that can be whether that's operating expenses for, you know, um, overtime for, you know, the employees going out for fire re related events or, you know, um, non-capital items um, or capital project expenses um, and things like that. So that's the 4.7 million. The total we've received from FEMA to date is 475,000. Um, so the net of that is we've spent out of reserves 4.2 million. Okay. I, I, I think I get that now. Okay. The other, the other question I had is are the numbers um, each year or are they cumulative? They look like each year. So the first column is cumulative from when the event happens. Right. Um, and then the two other columns, the 23, 24, is what we anticipate based on the budget spending in fiscal year 23, 24, and then obviously 24, 25. Okay, yeah. so it's about 15 million on line one, um, more, more or less. Mm -hmm. um, the reimbursement we're expecting to get from FEMA through the end of 25 is only about eight million, no, well, nine million. Yeah, it around is. there. Yeah. So there's your cash flow issue. Yeah, yes, big time. right. So do we expect to get more than that? In yeah, we do. Um, I I only included what's in the budget, but we there are projected to be more um, mm -hmm. in future years. I just. I guess in hindsight, I should have included that. Well, no, no, um, it, but it, it, yeah, it's, it's fine. I, I mean, I think for the budget, um, the, the, I mean, I'd like to see more than two years, right. but, that's, but that's just me. Um, I think for the budget part, the two years is great. When we start talking about these longer term mm -hmm. things, reserves, FEMA, that sort of thing, right. looking at it longer might, might be helpful, but I get what you're doing here. Yeah. It's, it's very good. And um I, yeah, I think uh, I'm just worried about cash flow. Yeah, right. Says, yeah. Before we leave that page, I wanted to ask a question rather than coming back yeah, to sure, ask this said. one specifically. Um, on the top line for CZU related expenses, mm -hmm. uh, we have on the order of uh, what is that about? About 14 million mm -hmm. so far. I think it's closer um, to 50. Yeah. Excluding, what's it about? Not an account. About, <laughs> um, um, if that's what we've spent so far, exclusive of this pipeline, the, the cross country pipeline, which we're throwing all kind of wild numbers around, how much more do we have? Because if this is 14 or 15, right there, we, we should were projecting 20 million before. No, that was all, I mean, we, we knew that was going to be 40. Right, right, right. But uh, let me address it to Rick. Uh, wow. How much? What's, do we have another 10 million coming in? For that, do we have another I, I don't, 30 I don't million believe, coming in? For I don't this? believe What's, so. It's the pipelines that, that threw I, us. I think this ca this covers probably most of the projects. Yeah, except it covers the raw water pipe, pipe. It does okay. cover most of the projects except the pipeline. Right. And won't the rate study take it out five years, Kendra? Um, our FEMA. Well, if you're going for a five-year rate, 
Yeah, so yeah. The, that's the, what you're looking for additional years will be, I think we'll cover on the rate study. Yeah, but, but five years is the max you can yeah, go. Yeah, exactly. To yeah, we're going to go for the max. But yes, so I, to answer your question, yes. But the you know, wild card here is the uh, uh, raw water supply limits. I understand yeah. that. Yes. Um, right. But other than that, okay. Yeah. You've identified pretty yes, much. Yes, have identified. And if we haven't identified it, we couldn't put it in the payment. Anyhow. Yeah, you haven't necessarily right. spent it, but you identified yeah, it's, it. Everything has been identified. Right. Now, the, the, the FEMA funds are right. coming through. Now, we do thing. have, you know, obviously this year's FEMA storm and, and projects. This is, that this is fire surcharge. This is just an fire surcharge. surcharge. That's all. This is correct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, no problem. Again, I, that's right. great. Um, on the property taxes, I know there's a, a big hop, and I think that reflects the fact that our demographics are changing and homes mm -hmm. are selling. And yeah. when they sell, they get revalued right. to the market. And right. since I think the median home price up here is approaching what eight hundred thousand and eight hundred fifty thousand, that's mm -hmm. a that's a big jump if that home had been in uh, Prop right. thirteen for many many years, mm -hmm. like like mine. Um, okay. On the um, salaries and benefits mm -hmm. um, number being uh, substantially lower in 22-23, um, that is due to a combination of open positions mm -hmm. and retirements that have been replaced by people lower Correct. in compensation. Correct. More so open positions. Though. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, think yeah. I figured that, yeah. Um, oh, some high school kids that would work for you. <laughs> well, funny you should mention that. Back when you could do that, I did work in our water system when I was a kid. Um, I also like the um, uh, some of the context you're putting around the um, uh, departments, headcount, spending, that sort of thing. I mm -hmm. think that's a really good uh, innovation as well. Mm -hmm. um, this this isn't directed to you because mm -hmm. that's not this isn't this question isn't for you but it's still not clear to me what the community is getting now that they were weren't getting in 2016 for what is a very significant increase in headcount and operating expenses around that. Um, it, it, it is it is still not clear and we have almost doubled our operating expenses. Um, since that time. And in fact, most of the rate increases of the last two rate increases have gone to operating not capital. So, you know, until we can answer that question, um, I, I have to say, okay, I understand the number and, and disclosing the number is great, but the quantifiable benefits are, are not explained yet. And I think that's a factor that should be addressed in whatever rate study we're doing and the rate increase that is coming. Uh, let's see here. Oh, there might have been a typo on one on page 41 of 62. Uh, you have a supply treatment department. I noticed the title on the graph is environmental department. Oh, we'll see. <laughs> okay, I'll make I'll In change fact, that. I think that's the case in all the graphs. It was, oh. Yeah, it, it seems like that got, or at least on the... Uh, Page 41? No, sorry, at least, no, no, I'm wrong. Uh, just on page 41, it looks like that leaked through. Okay, uh, let's see if there's anything else. Oh, yep, okay. Oh, on the capital projects, I think we also need to be looking at, which by the way, this chart on page 48 is good, um, but I think we also need to be looking at not only budgeted, because a lot of the charts earlier on the source and use of funds was around budgeted, but also actuals. What did we actually accomplish out of our capital budget? Mm. I don't know that we have ever received a report retrospectively looking at what capital projects were completed relative to what was planned in the budget. Mm -hmm. So it's great mm -hmm. we have the budget, um, great that we have the line items, big thumbs up, but now we need to take the next step. Yeah, that, um, so yeah, it's while it's not in the budget, that will um, show up in the quarterly report where we can show what was budgeted and what we actually spent. Okay. And whether the project is complete. Um, okay. Right, yeah. 
I think I heard you say that we're going to uh, hopefully get an answer on including the FRS money or not in the debt uh, coverage for the rate study. Yes. Right? That would yes. be important to know. And I think that was it. Okay. Um, uh, with all that said, I'm. I still. We're, we're getting closer to being able to support. For me to be able to support the budgets, um, Kendra, you've done a really good job on moving that ball down the field, and I really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, but I can't quite yet do it because of the other concerns I have about our operating expenses, where we're going with that, and how that feeds into capital. Um, that is still not. Uh, good and the fact that we don't have as a board or district what those target margins need to be to be sustainable to me is a um, is a big issue that has to be addressed very quickly particularly when we're going back out to the community to ask them for more, for more money sometime within the next few months um, Mark I just want to um, sort of what you were saying as part of the rate study, um, I don't know if it's possible to consider this as part of the rate study, but it would be really interesting to get a bit more information about um, the way other water districts are navigating increased operating costs because we're not alone. Like this is a this is a problem that is occurring across the industry. Um, as a result of rising operating costs that are largely out of our control. Um, as you pointed out, our costs are not going up because we're adding lots of extraneous staff or something. We can't even fill the positions that we have vacant. Um, so, you know, largely our costs are being driven by the cost of increasing energy, right? We have to pay pg and the same increasing bills that everybody else does. Increasing costs for generation services because we have to keep running our generators every time the power's out. And, you know, there's all of these other sort of factors. And so I think that as part of that rate study, we need to not just look internally at what our rates and costs are going to be over the next five years, but also look at like sort of generally in our area what's happening with other water districts. But, but, that, but that kind of begs the question, right? Because um, in fact, we are elected to address these issues and not sort of go, well, you know, the entire world has got a problem and we can't do it. We have to do something about our district. We are either going, you're either going to, at some point, forthrightly address the capital requirements of this district through substantial increases in operating uh, margin, or you're not. And if you don't, then we're going to continue doing what we've been doing for decades. Either we're going to rely on FEMA money for disasters, though at some point as our infrastructure gets better because of FEMA money, there's not going to be as much of that. Or we're going to rely on the kindness of strangers through grants. And at some point, the strangers are going to say, hey, we got our own problems to deal with. Or we're going to forthrightly address what our revenue and operating costs are going to be. When operating expenses go up, multiples of inflation over a historical period of time, that to me says we have an issue. And the fact that, 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 that they're not under control, particularly when the last rate study showed operating expenses increasing about the amount that I would have thought would be sustainable and would have increased our operating margin. We didn't do that. And the reason we didn't do that is because we didn't pass a budget that for that five-year period that we actually managed to. The rate study was sort of a, oh, okay, uh, this is this is what we think, why but we're not we making a that commitment. Budget? But why didn't we manage that budget because over five it, years, we, Bob? Because, why? Yeah. Because we didn't pass, the previous board that had this didn't pass a budget. They were doing year-by-year uh, uh, budgets. They didn't say, okay, for the rate study, we're going to come in and pass a five-year budget that commits us to this level of operating expenses, this level of capital uh, contributions, this operating margin, and these capital projects. That's part of it, but that's not the entire reason. And what you've been asking of us that, for years is, is to reason. 
behave not like a public government agency that is subject to statewide regulatory code, but is a private organization. And I know, I know the tropes about government needs to run more like business, but the fact of the matter is we can't run more like a business because we're a government agency subject to regulatory conditions. So hold on, I listen to you, hold on. So I, I think that the issue is that we need to understand within the envelope of operating agencies that are dealing with the same kind of conditions, what are our rate options that we can legitimately employ to address the kind of concerns you're raising? I don't see what they are, Bob, and I need someone to tell me what those options are because you keep saying there's a path. You don't ever introduce one. You ask the staff to figure it out for themselves. But we haven't gotten there yet because I don't think that the path that you believe exists actually does. So that's why I'm asking staff as part of the rate study if we can consider these questions that you raise. Well, that'd be great. By the way, I do believe that it's not my job to do operating budgets if the board wants, because I've been told in the past to stay out of operations by this board, I right. might add. Okay? So my thing is the board establishes policy. The policy must be achievable. <laughs> the policy that you establish, you basically ask staff to go do what it takes to meet the policy. If it's achievable. And, I mean, if we want no, the staff to find no. pink elephants, they might have a hard time that, doing that. that. But, but when you approach it from that point of view, then you're definitely going to get the right answer that you want to look for, which is there nothing you can do. Well, you've been approaching I don't believe that the there's nothing you're not getting the right answer and for until years. This, until this district can articulate to the community what they're getting for a doubling in operating expenses over the last 10 years, what they're getting now that they weren't getting 10 years ago, that is a problem. And this, this community should not give this district $1 more and increase rates until that and other questions can be answered. Jeez, I'm going to pay my taxes that way have, from now on. We have no way, we have no way to communicate to our community what it is we are actually doing with the money other than say, trust us. The so, last rate study, we said, trust us, it's going to be 3.8% increase in operating expenses. We did not do that. That was the path, Bob. I've, I've, so, heard, I've heard a question from Bob, and I've heard a question from Jamie. And, and I'd like to surface those questions. Uh, to, to Bob's point, you know, what's the district you know, getting now? Or what are the rate payers getting now? Um, you know, versus you know, 2016 with the increase in staffing costs. Well, I think that that's well done. Okay. But then Jamie is also asking what can the rate study bring us in terms of um, what? I reject the premise of the question that Bob is asking. So, no, I don't agree. And I reject that, the premise <laughs> that I have to op tell you what the operating is. You tell Bob's me what the question. rates have to be to be sustainable Bob, as Bob. a district. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's the rate study, Bob. Bob's, Bob's asking the question. He's asking, I'm not justifying this <laughs> question. Do that. I'm not justifying this question. He's asked a question. That's fine. I, I hear you. I just, I, I but you're reject the premise of the question, the question that he's asking. So I don't know if there's an answer to it. Right. I don't know that there is either. Right. I don't know if there is so, either. But, but I, there's a question here and there's a question here. You've asked, what can the staff get in a rate study to help us figure out okay, where so we're going as, so, I think those, so those are, are two separate questions. I we're not going to get an answer to either of them tonight. tonight. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. And I would, point out that I think the question that is in front of this board right now is does the budget that staff has presented accurately represent where we are financially now and essentially the consequences going downstream, which we don't look very good, right. uh, of the current approach to everything. Right. And so do, do we agree with this budget? Do we agree that yeah. this budget is an accurate budget? Yes. Well, no, yeah. not that it's accurate. For me, the question is not just that it's accurate. We, I mean, I don't have any question about the numbers that Kendra's come up with. I never have on any of those. The question is, does this budget represent a sustainable budget for this district to address its urgent capital needs on yes. infrastructure? And, that's, and the answer to me is no, it does not. It okay. may be yes for you, that's fine. But for no, me, no. it's no. I agree it does not represent that. But... What's in front of us now is what staff has presented as an accurate representation of what, where we are 
and where we would be as we continue on. It's up to the board to change the direction as you've indicated that there's a direction change that needs to be made here. It, it's up to the board to, to direct that. And I think for tonight, the thing we wanna ask ourselves is has Kendra presented an accurate presentation of where we are and what the consequences are down several years? And I think she has. Mark Dale has had her hand up for a while okay. now. So I just thank, wanna... thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, I was gonna go back to her after yes. Uh, we've concluded this in-person aspects here. Okay. Uh, we're good with that. I would like to hear from Gail also on this. Um, I I guess I would uh, echo, first I would echo what Jeff said. And I think it's entirely unrealistic for Bob to think that you can somehow pivot on a dime uh, and somehow reflect that in a biennial budget. If you want to make um, major policy changes about um, reserve levels and other things, that those are decisions that have to be discussed in great detail and they're not something that you can uh, implement overnight. Um, and so I would go to what Jeff said, that what we have in front of us is a, a budget, which I think does accurately reflect um, the situation now and any implications down the road. To answer Bob's question, he does this every time, and I, I guess I just get so tired of it, is that, uh, that this increase is pretty obvious where this comes from. One thing is, is during that interval, we added Lompico. So to think that somehow you can add a large uh, number of uh, users in a system that is ancient and requires a lot of repair and up date without a, an increase in uh, headcount is totally unrealistic. And if you look at the jump in headcount since 2016, that it happens around the time Long Pico. And since then, it's been um, much uh, a shallower increase. The other, Jamie has already pointed out, is that we are subject to a, a huge number of unfunded mandates. And um, I mean, one that Bob, you and I are involved in is Santa Margarita. This is not something that, you know, it costs us something on the order of $160,000 a year in administrative costs, plus a significant fraction of Rick's time and Carly's time. And this is, this is not something that um, is because we're being inefficient. This is a task that's been added to us. Um, another is the increasing standards for, for water quality, for environmental controls, for the level at which environmental um, stand, the, both the environmental standards, the, the fact that virtually every time we turn around, everything requires some kind of CEQA um, study. And so those costs are increasing. So to think that you could somehow just magically have um, our expenses go up by inflation is, is ludicrous. Um, and so I wish you'd stop making that argument and would do something that, you know, would be at least somewhat more realistic with what is going on. Um, then to Jamie's uh, question, we are somewhat limited in what we can ask the uh, rate study folks to do, in other words, there's there's a lot of questions that you know we we might all have, of, you know, that what are other people doing? They they did, for example, recently do the uh, Santa Cruz rate study, so they're familiar with that, and they're taking up um, Soquel Creek, and so I think that in an informal way they can they're very aware of um, what's going on regionally. But whether we can actually ask them um, within the scope of the contract that we have right now to do um, anything formally to try to answer the question, Jamie, I, you know, I think we we maybe need to formulate it a little bit more carefully and and go back to them. But certainly when they come um, on uh, what is it, our July thirteenth meeting, that you know that's a question you you can pose to them. Um, in a general way, and then 
we can go from there um, if there's things that we feel it's really important um, to understand. Okay. Um, I'd like to hear from anybody from the general public. I don't come back. I need to respond right away to Gail's, uh, particularly because she said ludicrous and all the rest of it. And so I okay. apologize, but I'd like to I'd like to do that. And I ask for your the community's forbearance on that. Um, I've heard this argument before about Montego being the um, one of the primary reasons for the significant increase in operating expenses and staffing in 2016. Um, I won't use the same word because I, I do think that gets into personal, not policy. But Lon Pico represents about 12% of our uh, current um, um, rate base. And the square miles associated with Lon Pico, I think, is even less. In addition, Rick himself has said, when I asked him this question, that the Lon Pico system was at least equivalent to um, the general average of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District in terms of quality and what kind of repairs that it had to do other than the tanks, primarily the tanks. So to think that we would have to um, increase staff by 40% to handle a 12% increase in subscribers to me is a big question mark. Really? I would have to say as at a business level that that doesn't seem to make sense to me. Um, yes, I, and, I, and by the way, I don't believe I have ever said that operating costs shouldn't go up. I think I've said they should go up at a particular multiple of uh, inflation, which coincidentally is about the same number that was in the last rate study, which if we had done that over the last 25 years would have resulted due to the magic of compounding an additional $30 million of operating margin that we could have applied to urgent capital infrastructure requirements. A simple one to one and a half percent lowering of the rate of growth and the operating expenses leads to huge benefits down the road. And I've been asking for this actually for many years. If we had started this in 2019, we would have been well on our way to increasing that operating margin in a way that wouldn't require trying to make a change on a dime, which I've never advocated for either. So um, at some point, this board and this district have to tell the community what they're going to do to address the actual infrastructure costs associated with that and what that rate structure is going to be. Historically, this board and district have not done that. So you can't have it both ways. You can't say, Bob, you need to be uh, showing us how you're going to change the operating expenses while not showing on the other side what you're going to do under your plan to address the capital infrastructure of this community. Because th this board has not done that historically to any level of satisfaction. Okay. I'd like to hear from anybody with the general public uh, comments on this aspect. Um, I see uh, Jim Mosier. Uh, can you hear me? We can now. Yes, I uh, just want to uh, uh, add, my, I'm on the uh, Budget Finance Committee as a citizen member, and I want to add my thanks to Kendra and the staff for putting together this budget. Yeah, we are definitely in difficult times. I just wanted to bring up one thing about this issue of the operating expenses. At, uh, at the Budget and Finance Committee, I asked about how, um, how we handle uh, the this, this staff component of capital expenses that, that we have. That what particularly came up for me was that Carly's time working um, on issues with the environmental, uh, with all the environmental issues that arise in capital projects is her time charged to the capital expense budget. And I was, what I heard back was, well, we just don't do it that way. Um, and um, uh, so it won't be showing up in the budget, but the, there's this reality that when we have so much capital, uh, uh, capital projects, both from 
the fire and the floods and also from the long time maintenance um, needs that a lot of the staff time that shows up in the operating budget is actually going to the capital projects. So as we increase the capital needs of the, pro of the, the district, we're gonna see operational expenses go up, uh, even though it's really to deal with these capital expenses. Um, so I think that's just something to keep in mind uh, as we go forward in looking at the operations budget. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, anybody else uh, from the general public on this? Um, without Eric Mark from Boulder Creek again. Um, sitting here listening to this, I don't hear anything that's unusual in terms of whether government or private sector. Um, you're talking about cost increases, you're talking about operational uh, costs and inflation and everything else and my question is is you know a lot of other bigger organizations do things slightly different um i will ask and how many acres of property does the the water district control as far as you have fenced this isn't a conversation but you can off make your comment please well it's it's kind of it's kind of all of the above i'm trying to make a point is you're talking about your operating costs. Um, you pump water during the day at, on, on as necessary, 24 seven, 365. What are your electric rates during the day versus electric rates at night? My, I'm shooting myself in the foot because that pump house is gonna run at night. Because if you're getting your, your electricity during the day, you're paying a lot more money for the electricity than if you were pumping water at night. And during the day when your water usage is highest, why aren't you reverse using some sort of generation process to feed back into the electric grid. All of your, all of your, I got a minute, two minutes. Yeah. All of your tanks, what are on the, what are on the roofs of your tanks? Do you have solar cells on the roofs of your tanks to supplement your pumps and your electricity or sell it back to the grid? That's what San Luis Reservoir is. It isn't a recreational, it's a storage battery. They, they pump water into the reservoir at night and they run it back to the turbines and they generate electricity during the day. Not saying we this has to be that, but thinking outside the box might buy you some margin until some more federal money comes or whatever comes. But it seems to me that this is a the same. I've been here since 1981, and materially nothing has, has really changed up here except a few more people. And I hear talk about the aging infrastructure and the processes that you're using. Okay, that's that's a given. It's and some of it's antique. I mean, they're they're Joe Cohn lives across the street from me. He says, you guys don't even know where all the water pipes are. All right, that's that's an understandable thing. But that doesn't mean that you can't approach this from a slightly different perspective and figure out a way to maximize what you get for each dollar spent. If you're gonna if it's if it costs you 10 cents to, to pump a gallon of water, and it being that's just an arbitrary number. But if you pump it at night, it costs you a nickel. To me, that's a no-brainer. But there's a lot of other things. This county, as far as I know, does not have any commercial solar on it. You go to San Benito County, all the farmland in San Benito County is being converted into solar farms. You go out into this into off of Highway 33, there's a solar farm out there that's got its own high-tension towers. So solar electricity in the areas where it makes sense actually makes sense. And if you use that just to offset some of your pump costs during the day, and if you fill your tanks up at night, you're using you're not using a high dollar electricity, and you're using solar to supplement what you do need. And I'm like I said, I'm not an engineer, and I just know what I see when I see out the world. And the thing that I hear is 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 very common. Okay, I have for your comments, sir. One quick comment I'd like to make. Okay. Um, you may have noticed that as we are replacing various tanks, we invariably make much bigger tanks. And currently we only have about a couple, a couple of days worth of storage in depending tanks. Depending on the time of year. Yes. Yeah, depending on the time of year. So one of the things that having bigger tanks does is it enables us to pump at night, which oh, is exactly absolutely. what we're doing. But having the bigger tanks is a key to that. 
storage and storage. Rick mentioned earlier that we use time abuse to program all of our funding. So, okay. Thank you for your comments. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank um, I agree with uh, Jeff's comments earlier that I think this uh, budget appropriately reflects uh, our current conditions and where we are now. Um, I appreciate the work that, uh, in particular, Kendra and Rick have put into this, but also uh, the Budget and Finance Committee in general and the comments that they've provided to get us to this point. Uh, this has been the third or the fourth round of discussions that we've had on this. And I think each time we uh, move this into a better uh, framework for where it is right now. So with that, um, I'd like to move that the board of directors uh, would approve uh, the attached or the resolution adopting the biennial budget for years 2023 through 2025. I'll second. Okay. Um, Holly? President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Ackman? Yes. Director Falls? No. Director Mayhood? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Um, moving on then to the uh, next item, the ad hoc report on the recruitment for uh, general manager. Um, Director Hill is prepared to give his report. Okay. Uh, since Jeff put together the memo for this, uh, I will go forward. Okay. okay. So uh, we all know that uh, General Manager Rogers has announced his desire to retire. And at an earlier board meeting, or selected Jamie and me, Director Ackman and me, to be an ad hoc committee to explore the process and uh, look at what we need to do to go forward. Uh, we've had several meetings. We've met with Rick. Um, we put together a uh, series of questions and uh, criteria that we would use to look at recruiting agencies. And subsequently, a letter was sent out to I think what 17 agencies, 17 agencies uh, to solicit proposals for recruiting uh, a new general manager. So uh, with 17 uh, requests for proposal out, we received three valid uh, responses. One of them, GMP consultants, we rejected primarily because almost all of the work that they do is in Washington State. They have very little experience, as we could, at least that we could tell, in the state of California and familiarity with people in California and our rules and regulations here. So we, we narrowed the field down to Ralph Anderson Associates and Coffin Associates. Uh, Jamie and I. Uh, held conference calls with principals of both companies for hour-long interview, uh, hour interviews. Uh, both of those firms have experience recruiting for public sector jobs, particularly in California. After talking with both of them, we have concluded that Ralph Anderson Associates was the best choice. Uh, we believe that the president of Ralph Anderson Associates would be more personally and directly involved in the recruiting process. Um, President of Cough Associates conversely gave the impression that uh, he was planning to delegate much of the recruiting process to a subordinate that we met, but who had very little to say during the interview. Um, we are more impressed with the thorough approach described by the President of Anderson for recruiting someone uh, who would be an excellent fit, not only from a resume point of view, but from a cultural and cultural fit and uh, someone that would provide uh, a feeling of confidence for the district. Um, we, and I, I have to thank Jamie for this, uh, we noted that Coffin Associates has a number of positions listed on their website as open that look like they've been open for an extended period of time, nine months, 12 months, more than that. 
and uh, Jamie called him on that. And um, the explanation we received was, oh, well, those positions have been filled, but they haven't reported for work yet, and we're <laughs> leaving them up there in case somebody doesn't show up for work. And we thought that really was a, kind of a bait and switch approach to running a website, uh, listing positions that uh, don't exist at this point. And the, we got the impression this was indicative of a lack of attention to detail on their part. So uh, we are recommending that we retain the services of Ralph Anderson Associates of Rockland, California to provide the recruiting services for hiring the district general manager to replace Rick Rogers upon his retirement. Um, motion, I move that the board direct the district manager to retain Ralph Anderson Associates of Rockland, California to provide recruitment services for the district general manager position as described in Anderson's proposal dated May 18th, 2023 for the fixed fee of $32,775, including recruitment services and all related expenses. Can I hear a second? Okay. I will second that. <laughs> okay, yes. Um, Jamie, since you were part of this ad hoc committee, I'd like to see if you have anything to add before I go to Gail and Bob myself, of course. Um, I'm, I think Jeff's done a really good job of um, over providing an overview of the interviews. It you know, just came down to um, what we thought was the best fit, the person that we thought was going to be most directly involved, the person that we thought was going to be most expeditious. Um, she seemed to have a real like path to getting the job filled in three months. And as Jeff pointed out, they made lots of noise, but they didn't seem to have a lot of success, or at least I can't tell from looking at their website what, what that success looks like. Um, so uh, I support the uh, motion with my second, and we're um, happy to answer any questions. Okay. All right. Uh, Bob? Sure. Yeah. I mean, sometimes in those websites, they leave positions open as a way to sweep in, yeah. you know, prospects. Save and switch. Well, it, 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 it gets their database up. Let's put it that way. Yeah. I mean, we know what they were doing, yeah. but the, I mean, uh, that's, that's the response they got was not. Yeah, they're not going to say, hey, yes. Yeah. It does not build confidence that they're filling the positions that are being listed with them quickly. Well, that, I mean, that's a different, that, that's a different question, obviously. But, um, and, and so their fee, if I, did I read it right, it's 25000 that was yeah. a fixed fee. And so we're, it'd be a, we, we feel, we collectively would feel the value of the additional 7000 for something. Yes. Um, did um, they provide you with sort of a list of positions they filled and how long it took to fill them? Both uh, agencies provided us with lists. Both of them had an impressive list. But but how long it took them to fill? Uh, I don't recall that the list actually said that. Yeah, no, it didn't have the actual timeline for um, the complete. And so that's why we asked the follow-up question because they were making the case that they had filled, you know, you know, a, a really significant number of these kinds of jobs at this level recently, which sort of surprised me, frankly, because I'm kind of aware of what hiring conditions are right now in public agencies. And um, when I went to their website, their website didn't really support what they were what they were suggesting to us. So I just don't when have. You're saying they. Which one? Huh, I'm sorry. Count? So, so I was asking a general question about okay. either one of them. Right. Did either one of them provide a list of positions and how long it took to fill? Because to me, I don't, I don't recall. I mean, we had a list of positions we knew when it had been filled, but I don't recall that we uh, asked them exactly okay. how long it took. Because they're saying three months to fill this. Right. I mean, I, I, I would sit there and say, first of all, I think that's pure BS. And, and but they could prove that by giving a list of positions and how long it took to fill them. And if it came out to be an average of around three months, then that's great. Um, so, I, I mean, I would say uh, my experience with these firms is they're all a little, yeah, yeah. Google Flames. Um, yeah. Not my first one, I'll give it a second. I, and, and my, um, so what happens if they don't fill it three months? Do we, is this a payment up front? Is it payment on completion? Is it payment on pro, uh, production of a district manager? How, I, what, what's the what's the term in that? I'm sorry. I, uh, how, is this a fixed fee regardless of their success? No, no. I, the, the fee is based on the successful uh, identification of a candidate. Successful identification of a candidate or that they um, fill the position? 
I see well, that's an interesting invoicing for service for one listen. year guaranteed if they'll refill it the second time. Okay. Well, Anderson, I know that's there included. Okay. That doesn't work out. I, I just want to. We have, we have a list here. Yeah. Oh, Sorry. Following kickoff and finalization of recruitment brochure, $9,835. So they have the brochure. Okay, so, so basically what we're saying here, I just want to make sure I'm clear about this, is that they get paid regardless of whether they perform or not. Well, but they also say that they will continue performing until they get the person. Right. So they don't just stop after three months. Okay. So um, after, after, no matter how long it takes, how much right. time. They're going to keep going. They're going to keep going. Okay. So after the closing date, $9,835. After finalist interviews, $9,835. And upon placement, $3,200. So, so we get progress payments as we're going here, but they don't stop after. after uh, and, the, and the contract will reflect that. that yes. They're on the hook until they they're fill on the this position. Yes. And there's a guarantee for one yeah, year. Yeah, one year three months. The first candidate doesn't work out. For yeah, free. I, I, did, I did see that. Yeah, yeah. I did see that. Um, in terms of identification of candidates, um, did you guys talk at all about their process of doing that, including identification of potential people in the area? In, uh, Santa Cruz, San Diego, Monterey, Andes, San Mateo, Santa Clara, that sort of thing. Because there are people, I think, that are in the area who might, and who are familiar with the San Luis Valley Water District that might actually be strong candidates. Yeah. yeah so, they have a process for doing this. They, you know, do they, they ask us who those people might be? Yes. Yes. So the we the, will have a meeting with them and cover those issues. Thank you. That's what I was going to say. They they plan to not only meet uh, meet with staff, but they want to or the candidate that we are suggesting we select as board will also um, orchestrate meetings with each individual member of the board to get more information about who mm -hmm. you think that she should be looking at, as well as any thoughts about like, you know, the, the process, the type of candidate, the right fit for the, the district. So, yeah. Okay. Well, um, three months from their lips to God's ears. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I, you know, have I have to see the move. I, I think, I think three months is, is probably optimistic, but um, very much so. But, but to that point, one of them says three months, the other one says four months. No, I know. I think yeah, we're, yeah, down to, it's, it's, we're down to one of these two that is one of the two of the best. Yeah, well, from said my it's a very tight market. Whether, whether it's three months or six months, this is the fee. No, no, I get that. I, I so, just want to make sure yeah, we're all we're, we're, we're all good. We're, we're all good. Sure. At the end of the day, Jamie and I felt the one group was right. more professional. Right. Longer than okay. okay, and justified the the value of that justified the increase in fees. Yes. Okay. Uh, Gail, um, I would just echo that I thought uh, Jeff and Jamie did a good job of vetting these people and they explained um, why they made the choice. So I um, agree with them. Okay. All right. Uh, I'd also like to say thank you to Jeff and Jamie for getting us to this point. Uh, um, it's never also fun. What's that? It's never fun. Um, thank you for dealing with oh, this unfun. I, I did have one last question. This is one of the more fun. Okay. Did, did you all talk about um, uh, community involvement in this process as well during the ad hoc committee? The, la the last time we did this, there was a community involvement component. I don't think we really addressed that. I think what they brought it up. So she she brought it yes. up and asked us if we would want to have that. And we said basically that we assume that we would want to have some kind of opportunity to introduce the, you know, maybe top two candidates um, in, to the board and the community, and that we would come back to that with a recommendation from the board about what that looks like mm -hmm. when we get to the point of having candidates that we want to introduce. Yeah, I, I think there was actually a, a more formal process the, the last time. Not that it necessarily told manager, but um, uh, not you, Rick, as one of the To be clear, well, I think that was a formal process the one before, but it was just it became very, very political. It, it, well, and I, I, I recognize that, particularly since I was involved in it at the time. Um, but I still felt there was value in having right. more of a community, yeah, more community. And it wound up the, with the community pick, the individual the community pick, the board picked a different one. Um, it it was, uh, and they may the community may have been right. 
<laughs> I don't know. It, it was just a unique process. The board wasn't. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Um, a few questions that I had here. Um, in uh, Ralph Anderson's uh, proposal, they list uh, district resources required by the consultant. And it's a bullet list of about 10 things that they're asking us for. Uh, it's on pages uh, 184, 185 of the agenda. Um, when do we, uh, how quickly do we need to address all of these things? Um, fast. In, well, fast. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so so okay. I, I think by Christmas, I think you have a lot of things down. How fast do you want? Basically, the first thing we have to do is sit down and reach an agreement with this person, mm -hmm. with, this, with this company. And then we'll address all those issues in the process okay. of reaching the agreement. Can I just say that the consultant is not going to reject the opportunity to find a general manager for us <laughs> if we don't have one of right. these items, like an educational okay. no. requirement, whatever, right? right. Okay. It's just that these are the things yeah. she's saying. If we can furnish these to her, it will help her to yes. move more quickly. So, so okay. Most of this is information that goes in the brochure, it goes in the advertisement, yeah, so they're going to want it pretty quick. Yeah. I love the world-class uh, part. That was very good. Um, I also want to reflect that I was impressed by the um, experience uh, or the, the list of candidates that Ralph Anderson provided um, and where they were placing those individuals. They went through and they called out utility uh, related experiences. Yeah. The other firm provided candidates that they provided, but it was for uh, city manager, general manager, police city chief, government, yeah. a police, exactly. It was more much more broad and general. Um, their proposal, uh, COFs, looked to me like it was more generic. Mm -hmm. They could have given that to them. This one was tailored more towards yes. the utility-related environment, mm -hmm. which to me was saying, okay, they were paying attention, more attention yes. to what we were asking yes. for. That's exactly what Jamie and I felt okay. overall. I also am noting that it looks like um, people use them over and over again. Mm -hmm. They weren't just one and done. They went back to them for other positions. So. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, then we have a motion on the table in front of us. But before we go there, uh, since uh, we mentioned his name several times here, I wanted to ask, Greg, thoughts, comments, anything from your perspective in this? Um, given no, not really. I know Ralph Anderson is has been the go-to firm for a lot of public agencies, and you've got a good firm. Um, and um, you know, I'm just probably support moving ahead on this. I think we should come back and agendize transition. Well, I don't believe that Brown Act would allow us to discuss transition tonight. Mm -hmm. um, with this item, but I think we should agendize transition because now that this is in in motion, you know, I have things to do in motion to yeah. start my retirement yeah. uh, with PERS and, and, and so forth. So now that this is in motion, I think we should discuss um, transition. Mm -hmm. um, so I can do what I have to do and, and you know, with the loss of our district engineer and loss of district council, both, you know, long-term employees, um, there's going to be some type of transition that, you know, just for me to walk out the door in two months or three months, you know, I'm happy to do that, frankly, but I, I don't know what that would do to this person um, to start off would have one heck of a you don't want to just hand them the keys as you're walking. Well, I mean, that's definitely, you know, that, that wouldn't hurt my feelings, <laughs> quite frankly. Um, but I don't think that's the best thing for the district. But on the other hand, you know, the manager is the manager, and that person needs to take the reins and, and run with it. So um, what we should agendize it and talk about it so I can move ahead with my plans. Right. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we have a, a motion and a second. We need to go to public. On the table uh, in front of us. Public comments. Right. Uh, but with that, uh, do we have any comments from the general public? 
on this. Um, yes. Yes. Like huh? uh, my name is Rick Moran. I'm from Ben Long. This is a last minute. Last minute. Uh, Rick Rogers deserves a smooth transition into retirement. To help facilitate that transition, the ad hoc committee should and plan for the possibility for the need for an ad for an interim district manager. Rick has been an interim district manager a few times, and I'm sure he understands the uh, importance of preparing for such a possibility. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, anybody else um, from the public? I see none. Um, so, Holly? President Smalley. Yes. Vice President Hill. Yes. Director Ackerman. Yes. Director Pulse. Yes. Director Mayhood. Director Mayhood. Did she leave? Did we lose her? Maybe we lost her. She's still we the show form, and so she might be just muted. She might be. Uh, okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Motion okay. passes. Okay. Um, the consent agenda. Uh, do we have anybody uh, wishing to pull anything uh, from this? Uh, district reports. Um, Committee reports. Um, any questions um, on that, Jeff? No. Okay, Jamie. Well, uh, no, not on the budget okay. finance committee. No. Gail. No. Okay. Um, and next meeting. Yeah, I'd like to bring up the question. We do have the next meeting on the, the last part of this agenda. It's right after the 4th of July week or after the 4th of July holiday. I do have a lot of staff out that week and we do have some board members that won't be able to make the meeting. I am going to Holiday it doesn't work good, and then we have the workshop right after which I sent out the, uh, the rough agenda for that workshop. We used to not even schedule one because of exactly this reason. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And just before we adjourn, I do want to thank Kendra and the management team, and Josh did put a lot of effort into the capital part of the budget. Kendra you did a fantastic job, and sort of the man management team. A lot of changes and a lot of information. Um, she worked tirelessly on that budget and tried to meet the needs of the board and the community. And thank you to the staff for being able to get this to us in a timely manner after the loss of Josh, which realistically now has only been two weeks ago. So I commend all of the staff for that. It's greatly appreciated and I miss it mostly. So thank you. And there is a, uh, Holly, you want to, there is a uh, memorial service being planned? Uh, there is a uh, memorial service, more like a celebration of life, is being planned uh, for July 23rd. It'll be held at um, his parents' home in well, Watsonville. But uh, we don't have any. Okay. Could I make a suggestion that um, when we make our motion to adjourn the meeting, we make our motion in Josh's honor? That's typical in um, 
my world. So I'd like to uh, move that we adjourn this meeting in honor of uh, Josh Wolf and all that he meant to the water district. You're here. Thank you for that thought. Mm -hmm. Do I hear a second? I don't know if that's a motion, but that's it was a motion. It was a motion. Yes. Then yes. Okay. Okay. Nine oh four is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.